So hello everyone, my name is Frank Ruda and I'm very happy to welcome all of you to the Royal Institute of Philosophy, University of Dundee Philosophy Program um, branch um, speaker series and in the name of the Scottish Centre for Continental Philosophy I'm very happy to welcome all of you and especially our guest Emily Apter. Before I will disappear, um, I just wanted to very briefly mention three things. There will be two more events in our speaker series. The next one is going to be a discussion between uh, our colleague uh, Tina Rock and Lee Braver on uh, Tina Rock's new book. That's going to happen on the 13th of April and on the 4th of May. And this is something I want to uh, uh, also mention. We're going to have Rebecca Comey in a dual event that is supposed to say she's going to be here in Dundee um, and we're nevertheless televised um, and uh, screen the event. Um, but that is an in-person event and for that, uh, because this is the case, I wanted to especially mention that. Um, right now, I give um, the word uh, to my colleague, uh, Oshin Kiwan, who's going to introduce our uh, speaker for tonight. On to you. Thanks, Frank. Uh, so welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Oshin Kiawan, and I'm here today as a representative of the Scottish Centre for Content and Philosophy here at Dundee. It's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Emily Abda in our ongoing Royal Institute of Philosophy talks. Emily Abda is the Julius Silver Professor of French and Comparative Literature at New York University. She was also the president of the American Comparative Literature Association, the ACLA, in 2017 to 2018. She's the author of many books, and I will name only three whose titles indicate her preoccupations, namely translation, literature, and politics. And they are The Translation Zone, Against World Literature, and Unexceptional Politics. Unusually though, some of Abda's editorial projects are just as significant as her monographs. She is, for example, one of the editors of Thinking with Balabar, and the forthcoming volume entitled Living in Translation that collects Spivak's writings on translation together, which is coming out later in 2022, I believe. It's actually She's out. The, oh, Amazon says it's coming out in uh, a few months. Uh, maybe know. maybe the official publication, but ah, I've, I've, okay. I've seen it. Ah, you got an advanced copy. <laughs> um, um, she's also perhaps also well known as one of the editors of the monumental Dictionary of Untranslatables, a philosophical lexicon, itself a translation of Barbara Cassin's vocabulaire Européen de philosophie. Theorizing in so-called untranslatables, a term that no doubt she will come back to in her talk, after has thus opened channels of contact between philosophy, comparative literature, politics, and translation studies. This crossing of channels has meant she spends a lot of time at border checkpoints, for example, between philosophy and translation studies, or philosophy and politics, or philosophy and literature. Another border checkpoint for her has been distinctly Franco-American, since her work is also explicitly in conversation with a number of French language philosophers, including Barbara Cassin, Etienne Balabar, Jacques Derrida, and Badieu, to name only some of the most prominent names here. I now want to take a moment to underscore the political ramifications of her work on untranslatables. The very first translation of Barbara Cassin's French language vocabulaire European de philosophy was not into English, but Ukrainian. As Barbara Cassin wrote in 2014, and I stress this was in the past because her words echo extraordinarily in light of present events. So these words are from Cassin. The Ukrainians, led by Konstantin Tsigov, were the first to want to translate the dictionary, the vocabulaire in French, as a way to put Ukrainian philosophical language to work and differentiate it clearly from the Russian language, and in order to create a community of philosophers. At the same time, and I think this at the same time is really crucial, they translated it into Russian alongside Russian researchers and edited it in Russian in Kiev. It's a collaboration that transcends the present conflicts. Uh, pause here for a second, just remind you, uh, Kassai is writing this uh, in 2014, many years uh, prior to the present conflict. So the conflict he's talking about are the ones happened over the last decade. It is a collaboration that transcends the present conflicts and a necessary act that deserves to be recognized and supported by Europe as an example of intellectual, intelligent 
piecework. Rereading these words of Cassin in light of recent events, I googled Konstantin Sigov and discovered that he's in fact remained in Kiev since the beginning of the invasion, has in fact been giving interviews to French newspapers describing the situation of the city and the country in recent weeks. Turning back to the picture of our translatables, I then discovered that he was not only a translator of this text into Ukrainian and assisted with the Russian translation as an act of bridge building, but also wrote an entry on a Russian word that is included in the Dictionary of Untranslatables. This word is the word pravda, most commonly translated into English as truth or justice. As he explains in the entry, there is more than one word for truth and justice in Russian, but pravda indicates a truth that is just, normative truth, truth that ought to be, as opposed to a truth that simply is, a descriptive truth. As Sigov thus notes in the entry on Pravda, Pravda, quote, is never used to designate scientific truths, unquote, in Russian. That is, truths that simply are, that tell us the way the world is, not the way the world ought to be. Turning to Apta's title this afternoon, translating Eco-Sophy towards a vocabulary of climate justice, I just wondered what was the Russian for justice in climate justice? Because I don't speak Russian, but I was curious. It turns out to be, and you'll have to forgive my Russian here, spravedli uh, one of the words in Russian for justice, because there are multiple words for justice, but this kind of justice, contra pravda, is in fact separated from questions of truth. But this linguistic formulation in Russian, namely that when they speak of climate justice in Russian, they use the word for truth that is not related to, but relates to truth and justice, this linguistic formulation in Russian itself seems very telling and is pertinent to Abda's title. What kind of truths are we telling when we speak about climate justice? Are these the kind of truths that tell us simply the way the world is? Or are they also describing the way the world ought to be? And how will this all be translated? It's well, my great pleasure to pass on to Emily Atta and to hear a talk translating Ecosophy towards a vocabulary of climate justice. Thank you so much, Oshin, and, and to Frank for inviting me. I wish I could be in Dundee in person. I've never been there. Um, and hopefully there'll be a, an opportunity when travel gets a little bit easier. Uh, I'm so glad that you did bring up Konstantin Sigov's name because I've just come back from Paris yesterday and um, he was, and, and saw Kassan, the whole team that was in, or well, some of the team that was involved in the vocabulaire. And he he's not only taken a, a pretty extraordinary active role um, in the in on the front line. Um, he's been beaming in at various events. Um, the the first image that's that's up here is of the original edition of the voc Vocabulaire européen des philosophies, which she uh, spearheaded in and published in 2004. What you see next to it in red is the English edition, which was somewhat um, expanded, uh, slightly different from the original. And above it, this was part of a little exhibition at the New Museum in New York a few years ago. You see the first excerpt of it in English. It was originally going to be translated by a collective associated with the journal Radical Philosophy. And they published the long entry that was uh, put together by, um, written primarily by Etienne Balibar, but also with contributions from Cassin and from Sandra Logier uh, on the subject, uh, which is it's almost like a little book in itself. And that's just to give you some material reminder of the point of departure for some of what I'll be discussing today. Um, the talk is in some ways a kind of critique, auto-critique of the book, much as I think. <laughs> 
It's been uh, a life changer for me to work as one of the editors on the English edition and to be involved in its future, in its continuing ecosophy, the relationship between ecology and philosophy. And that's pretty much what I'm going to talk to about uh, in some depth today. But before I start, I just wanted to thank Machin for that wonderful little comment about the term justice and its different um, ambivalent usages, its resistance, the, res the, the, the way in which Pravda does not uh, carry over into the Russian term for climate justice. And that is something I overlooked. And I feel like in, in light of the events ongoing, it's something that I really have to think about further. So with so my my thanks and gratitude for for a provocative and thought and comment observation that I hope we can perhaps discuss more in the discussion. So um, ever since Nugugi Watongo issued the injunction to decolonize the mind in his landmark book of 1986, the task of decolonizing Euro-dominant lexicons of critical theory, pedagogy, information technology, global economy, law, theology, biopolitics, species anthropology, and the humanities disciplines more generally has been paramount. In this context, translation theory becomes a form of concept work that contests the neo-colonial privilege of dominant languages, typified by the preferential status conferred on NGO style English or globish as the lingua franca of human rights, international law, and environmental protection. Drawing on expansive lexicons emerging in the environmental humanities and material sciences, on political theories of cosmopolitics and indigenous cosmos, and on Félix Guattari's notion of ecosophie, used loosely for political habitats at once ecological and cognitive, I want to underscore the place of linguistic ecologies in the greater ecology of nature and theories of planetary coexistence. These concerns call for an approach that works intralingually which is to say within Englishes to access new eco-political eco lexicons for Turanian life and modes of being, and interlingually, which is to say across standard languages and indigenous conceptual worlds. In such contexts, untranslatability, whose salient symptoms are mistranslation, constant retranslation, and what I called in against world literature as a militant semiotic intransigence is understood not so much as an impediment to communication, but as resistant opacity. It designates resistance to semantic regimes of forced equivalence and the appropriative reach of tourism, the culture industry, and monolithic worldviews underwritten by capitalism driven economies of surplus value production. This is what I think Edouard Glisson, the preeminent theorist of archipelagan consciousness, had in mind when he affirmed the right to opacity, le droit à l'opacité, in his book's po book, Poetics of Relation, which came out in 1990. The opaque, he specified, is not the obscure, it is that which cannot be reduced in the sense of excluded, grasped, enclosed, or appropriated. I began to think about untranslatability as the basis for critical methodologies in the human sciences while working on this edition of, this, of, of the vocabulaire. For Cassin, what mattered most was how an untranslatable performed. In the ensemble of her writings on the pre-Socratics and the sophists, she used the construct to point up the instability of meaning and the role of nonsense or nonsense in sense making. 
She underscored the performative dimension of sophistry as an art of doing things with words, of course, in dialogue with Austin. And she identified a distinct temporality of translation grounded in the premise that translational labor is interminable, incomplete, a kind of process philosophy of infinitude. Despite its aim to democratize philosophy by mapping a noetic field beyond the usual languages of Greek, German, French, and English, the dictionary fell short of any truly global remit. Funded by the EU, it foregrounded the Europhone languages with few exceptions. The failure to include vernacular and indigenous languages, as well as dialects and creoles, amounted to a lost opportunity to add linguistic depth to the critical understanding of imperialism or to gauge the damages of epistemicide, not only in philosophy, but in the greater circulation of ideas between the global South and the global North. Um, let's have the next three slides. That's uh, the subject. Next, next. yeah. Um, so this is the, <clears throat> such shortcomings of language have been partially remedied in recent years by the dictionary's translation into Arabic, Brazilian, Portuguese, and African languages. The Wolof one is just beginning, but it remains, and, and I show you here a page from the Arabic edition, which focused on the um, political vocabulary primarily. You can go to the next slide. Yeah. Um, you can see they, they pulled out certain terms and um, this one, this particular edition was edited by the philosopher Ali Ben Maklouf, who, uh, whose work I will re be referring to a little bit later. So um, these, the shortcomings of language, the Eurocentrism remedied somewhat through the project to turn this vocabulary, this dictionary, into a, different iterations through language. But I still feel that it remains for projects like words in motion, we can have the next one. Um, a global lexicon edited by Anna Singh and Carol Gluck in 2009. Um, it's to these that it, I think it remains to advance the goal of theorizing in non-Western untranslatables. Thing to give but one example, contributed an essay on the Indonesian term uh, masyarakat adat, roughly indigenous people. And in tracing how adat from an Afri Arabic word meaning that which cannot fit into law, um, to in tracing how that was reshaped in colonial and nationalist Indonesia to refer to native law and the spirit of native culture, she makes the bold claim that, quote, Indonesian debate over Adat helped forge the forms of cultural nationalism that inspired North American minorities, including Native Americans in the 1960s. Such cultural nationalism gives a heady charge to the possibilities for indigenous organizing that took off in the 1970s, end of quote. Um, Dilip Menon's forthcoming collection, Changing Theory, Concepts from the Global South, also contributes, I'm sure, in I've, I've seen parts of it in no small way, to philosophizing in non-European languages with keywords that tap into the unfinished intellectual and, art, and artistic legacies of tri-continental internationals, Afro-Asian solidarity movements in the wake of decolonization, the Bandung Conference, Archipelagan consciousness as defined by Glissant and epistemologies of the South as formulated by many Latin American theorists, notably Boaventura de Sousa Santos, Enrique Dusso, and Walter Mignolo. To redo the dictionary of untranslatables in the spirit of a decolonial reorientation of translation theory, philosophy, and the human, human sciences more generally, would require supplementation in key areas of critical thought, particularly those dealing with climate change and planetary justice. Missing were terms such as green as a synonym of sustainability or loss and damage, 
associated with the 2013 Warsaw International Mechanism for Loss and Damage. Um, more recent critical terminology, slow violence, collapsology, extractivism, overburden, toxicity, climate precariat, climate denialism, ecocide, Eurocene, Anthropocene, the list goes on, of course. These, these terms were either not yet fully in circulation or not recognized as having philosophical traction. Bruno Latour's Turanian glossary of Gaia wasn't there because most of it really hadn't yet been invented. And I'm going back here to 2004. Absent too is the word ecology whose complex history, we can put in the next slide up, whose complex history as an untranslatable was noted by British critic Raymond Williams when he added it to the 1983 edition of his landmark work, Key Words. Ecology, we learn, was a late arrival to English imported from the German ökologie, from Greek oikos, meaning household. It was coined by Ernst Haeckel in the 1870s to describe the relationality of plants and animals to each other and to their external habitat. Williams mentions a host of cognate terms spawned by ecology. You can see them there, ecotone, ecotype, ecospecies, and so on. Some have clearly fallen out of use, but what the list itself is indicative of is the way in which linguistic ecologies, which have their own life of dissemination, shadow the migratory patterns of species and microorganisms within complex natural ecosystems. So what do we find in the Dictionary of Untranslatables? There's an entry on Greek oikeosis, which technically translates as appropriation, according to the authors, uh, in English, conciliato in Latin, which contains the meaning of living in accord with nature, and the related term oikonomia, economy, with a note on its patristic ecological meaning of modalities of the management and administration of the, of, of the visible world. That's a quote. An insert entry by Barbara Cassin on cosmos and Heraclitan cosmology, which appears under the general rubric of Welt, of world, that was written by Pascal David, underscores the aesthetic dimension of world order in ancient Greek thought. Kant's universal natural history and theory of the heavens doesn't feature in any of the entries devoted to Kantian concepts. Carl Schmitt's 1942 Land and Sea, a world historical meditation mentioned only glancingly. A very short entry on nature written by Pascal David examines the Latin word natura as a translation of the Greek phusis. It, it focuses on Heidegger's rendering of Fusus as Aufgang, opening up, emergence, as Aufgehen in the sense of growth and fluorescence, and as Geschlecht in the sense of generation, line, race, species, and as das Grundwort des Anfänglichen Denkens, the basic word of beginning thought. And there's a small insert on Umwelt pointing up the gap between English environment and the Heideggerian meaning of milieu, where worldly externality is trained subjectively inward towards Dasein. The narrow philosophy and nature purview, this narrow philosophy and nature purview commits an injustice to eco-philosophy, bracketed in the continental tradition by, one could say, or a Nietzschean vitalism, or even by André Gorce's writings on political ecology in the 1970s, published in um, Eco Ecologie et, et Politique. Um, and then, philosoph then last but not least, an injustice to ecosophy, the quintessential theorem of a turn in theory to problems of planetary ethics, ecocide, and translations of different orders of materialism, including linguistic and poetic. Ecosophy was originally coined by the Norwegian philosopher mountaineer Arne Ness. We can have the next slide. Um, in 1973, as part of an ambitious program of deep ecology, 
It appears in the title of a Canadian journal founded by some of his followers in 1983. It's called The Trumpeter, still going, I think. Um, and here and in else, elsewhere, Ness personalized his concept creation as Ecosophy T, with the T standing for his mountain hut. Next slide, please. Tvergestein, very Heideggerian hut, and his favorite pastime of tolkning, a Norwegian expression for translating and interpreting, central to his construct of the ecological self with a capital S. This was a self whose capacities for extended identification drew inspiration from Gandhian nonviolence, Mahayana Buddhism, Spinozian pantheism, and the Norwegian concept of friluftsliv, literally free air life, referring to the experiential life outdoors. Um, and in Paris, I met two Swedish publishers and asked them about Arnie Ness uh, just a few days ago. And they, they both rolled their eyes because he, they said he was just absolutely inescapable in their youth as someone they had to study, but then completely disappeared. And they feel like right now it's, it's absolutely the moment to, to re-examine his work and legacy. Under recognized by the discipline of philosophy itself, Ecosophy implies a practice of philosophy that shakes up the classical branches of logic, ethics, metaphysics, epistemology, and aesthetics. Where the still dominant analytic tradition continues to foreground proof, veridiction, probability, and operations of rational calculation and extended consciousness suitable to AI, and of course, I have in mind some of uh, David Chalmers's recent work, Ecosophy emphasizes theories of distributed agency, remote responsibility, and universes of virtuality relevant to the metaphysics of matter and the materialities of extractivism. It harks back to the 70s theories of unstable flows, characteristic of work by Michel Serre, um, Gilles Deleuze, and uh, Luce Irigaray and the ontological instability of ecosystems that characterized eco-constructivism and looks ahead in Frédéric Nera's estimation to what he calls a multinatural, relational and intensive field of life and non-life. Updated for the present day, ecosophy critiques, and this is my view of it anyway, <laughs> ecosophy critiques the Anthropocenic temporal order qualified by Catherine Yusuf as a quote, geologics of existence, simultaneously hacking and resyncing the planet and its temporal structures to produce an arrangement of the future that looks decidedly irrational and unthought, end of quote. It arguably also refers to, a, to forms of poesis that draw on natur philosophy dark pastoral and dystopian techno science. And it is increasingly a field in its own right, a transdisciplinary praxis spanning the work of Gregory Bateson, Sylvia Winter, Edouard Nisson, Bruno Latour, Isabel Stengers, Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak, Ashil Membe, Depesh Chakravarty, Rosalind Morris, Karen Barrett, Anna Singh, Denise Ferreira da Silva, Gilles Clément, Baptiste Morisot, Morisot, Pierre Charbonnier, Emmanuel Ecocha, the list goes on, and not least, Félix Quattari, whose Chaosmos, Les Trois Écologies, and Qu'est-ce que l'écosophie, um, translation for those who might need it, Chaosmosis, The Three Ecologies, and What is eco Ecosophie, written against the backdrop of Chernobyl, the AIDS crisis and the first Gulf War um, began to appear shortly before his death in 1992. It's to Guattari, I would contend, that we owe the term ecosophie in some of its most theoretically adventurous and creative uses. He be began deploying it in a local context to ward off the tendency in the French ecology movements of his time, 
to turn the defense of species into a kind of nature identity politics, all too easily appropriated by romantic vitalism and the political right. And we've seen this happen today, I think, with some of the alliances between the Green Party and extreme right parties in all over the place, certainly Britain and the US, but uh, very prominently in Germany and in France too, and other places. Those are just the ones I'm most familiar with. In the early 90s, Guattari saw society as a collection of atomized individuals turned in on themselves, alienated by what he's called capitalist homogenesis, infantilized by mass media and riven by inter-ethnic conflict. The forms of anarcho-anti-capitalism, molecular revolution and schizoanalytic intervention that he and Deleuze had injected into politics and theory in the wake of May 68 had grown chill during the what was called the winter years of post-socialist neoliberal backlash in France. Ecosophie was born of the loneliness of the stranded left, which found itself incapable of mobilizing against accelerationism or overcoming the suspicion that a new ecological industry is in the process of making a place for itself within other capitalist markets. As Guattari wrote in a chapter on the ecosophic object in Chaosmosis, and we can have the next slide, and this also appears in Three Ecologies, a version of this next uh, passage. I don't know if we can make it bigger, but I guess you can see. Um, geopolitical configurations are changing at a great pace, whilst the universe of Universes of techno science, biology, computer technology, telematics, and the media further destabilize our mental coordinates on a daily basis. The suffering of the third world, demographic cancer, the monstrous growth and degradation of the urban fabric, the insidious destruct destruction of the biosphere by pollution, and the incapacity of the system to reconstruct a social economy adapted to new, to new technologies. All of this ought to lead, he writes, to the mobilization of minds, sensibilities, and wills. But the acceleration of a history that might lead us to ruin is masked by the sensationalist, in fact, banalizing and infantilizing imagery that the media concoct from current events. So you can also really hear the Debordian echoes here. Asked in 1992 by John Johnston to clarify his use of ecosophie in the three ecologies, Guattari invoked the radical power of what he called incorporeal species to form alliances with material, vegetal, and animal species. Rejecting the anthropocentric notion of a natural human, he imagined heterogenetic crossings between existential and machinic phyla, transhuman, transspecial, and transontological. In many ways, we can see ecosophie as the precursor of all kinds of trans theories, including those of speculative materialism, flat ontology, vibrant matter, guerrilla metaphysics, some of them loosely assembled under the banner of object-oriented ontology. What sets ecosophie apart from these later theoretical movements is its militant ethos, its insistence on strategies of micro-political intervention, these are interventions guided by the figure of a micro-mechanic who appears in lanti Edipe, the anti-Oedipus, scrutinizing the deterritorialized constellations of the pre-conscious or molecular materials, what he calls zones of presence that elude the grip of molar aggregates, and unlocking the capacities of individuals as desiring machines. On micropolitics, something that's interested me a great deal and was um, the subject of a chapter of my book, Unexceptional Politics. Guattari was with Foucault, with whom he shared an interest in the workings of molecular power and an involvement with institutional psychiatry, medical legal practices and regimes of care. Foucault's microphysics of power grounded in a biopolitical model of social organization and discursive hierarchy, gave rise to Guattari's micro-politics of desire, 
with desire understood as, quote, everything that exists before the opposition between subject and object, before representation and production, end quote. In a book, Nouveaux Espaces de Liberté, New Spaces of Liberty, Freedom, co-authored with Tony Negri, Guattari glossed micropolitics as something he called a habitat communism, shaped by processes of singularization, auto-organization, and auto-valorization, and embodied in experimental communities willing to quote, stand up for themselves without a transcendent ideal or determinant concept, able that is to produce tr transversal connections that recreate existence as the singularities of real encounters are actually lived. What's notable here is not just the hitching of habitat to communism, the latter we must remember a controversial term in the mid 80s when France was pivoting to the right. But also Guattari's insistence on lived experience, an uncharacteristically phenomenological expression for him until we remember his immersive clinical experience with psychotic patients at Laborde and activism in radical psychiatry movements. Um, there's a very recent book by Camille Ropsis on radical psychiatry in France, if anyone is interested, it's just come out. In a 1990 interview published in what is Eco Ecosophie, Negri expressed concern that micropolitics dissipates the force and possibility of the revolutionary event. The emphasis on ceaseless mutation, proliferating subjectivities and non-genealogical epistemologies could give rise to a destabilized ontology of shifting surfaces and indifferent informatic registers of history. What, Negri wonders, is the new form of Lebensfeld that allows for self-orientation and the possibility of political struggle? How does one intervene in a schizoid eventual structure or discern the form of constituent power. Guattari counters that the event is dependent on belief in a saving grace or gift from God that shackles life to transcendentalized notions of finitude. It's in this context that he anoints Ecosophie as another name for process and as a cartography arising at the juncture of environmental and mental ecologies. Flushing the threadbare vocabulary of environmentalism with his characteristic jargon of complexity, these terms you'll recall are things flux, chaosmosis, informatics, territorial coexistence, deterritorialization. He would Guattari would remake philosophy for the conditions of a dying Anthropocene, a time catalyzed not by singular events or revolutions or pre-existing political concepts but by shifts in climate and livable habitat. In many ways, Guattari might be seen to anticipate Latour's effort in, uh, especially in a book, Down to Earth, Politics in the New Climatic Regime, to rethink politics as a problem of orientation to an earth no longer bipolar in the sense of left, right, Jacobin or federalist, but transferical in the sense of transontological. If not directly predicated on Ecosophie, Latour's vision of planetary ethics, I would venture, was importantly enabled by Guattari's expansion of ecology into ontological multiplicities and transmedial aesthetics. This becomes clear when we delve into Guattari's occasional writings where the term takes on wayward and experimental applications. In Vers une Ecosophie, he wrote of the need to instill in humanity the sense of responsibility, not only to its own survival, but to the future of all life on the planet, animal and plant species. And then he adds music, art, and cinema, feelings of love, compassion, and fusion within the cosmos. <clears throat> in his analysis, sorry. <clears throat> airplane throat. <clears throat> in his analysis of artist David Wonorovich's 
uh, of, of artist David Wojnarowicz, Ecosophie becomes the way of describing Wojnarowicz's rendezvous with death, his expression, which involved writing with the AIDS virus as if it were a cipher, a live material that could be mobilized against society's deathly passivity towards HIV. In a review of Pierre Lévy's uh, Technologies of Intelligence, Ecosophie becomes synonymous with cognitive ecology, building out Gregory Bateson's ecology of mind into a kind of biome where affects, phantasms, and machinic thoughts, thought processes coalesce. Bateson formulated an ecosophy that was not so much thinking about ecology, but that does ecological thinking. In a phrase that could have come right out of Guattari's schizoanalytic playbook, he quipped, you forget that the eco-mental system called Lake Erie is part of your wider eco-mental system. And that if Lake Erie is driven insane, its insanity is incorporated in the larger system of your thought and experience. I think that idea of a lake going insane would be absolutely um, of a piece with the, the schizoanalytic cartography of Watari. And I think that way of, of that kind of paradigm, that ecology of mind paradigm, uh, seems to have affected a shift in Guattari's thinking or consolidated it from kind of radical psychiatry focused on the undoing of the Oedipal symbolic, which we see so prominent in the anti-Oedipus, so away from attacks on that, uh, towards an, an eco-philosophical praxis that is very much uh, anticipatory of things today. Now for Kotari, there was of course no one ecosophie. At times it was synonymous with subjective cross-speciation, at other times with urban nomadism and effective responses to what he called strange attractors in the city. As an ecology of mind, Ecosophie was identified with the dense mass of psychic experience and aleatory memory that tends to go missing in structural theories of the event. It puts out feelers to the phenomenal world, producing what he called vertigos of imminence. It relies on a sixth sense of the power of ordinary words or deterritorialized expressions to suddenly become available politically springing into action from the mental habitus or environmental surround. And you could say that um, Oshin just did this with the term pravda and its counterpart uh, in the Russian terms for climate justice. If Guattari's writings can sometimes seem repetitive, stuck in its own stuck in its own feedback loop or deficient in estimating the impact of racial capitalism on global eco-politics, his ecosophical philosophemes are, I would still argue, not without interest for contemporary concept work on climate justice. For when reworked, they point up under theorized modes of subjectivation in the politics of planetarity. And at this point, it strikes me as a kind of instructive exercise to read Guattarian uh, Ecosophie, alongside or with Gayatri Spivak's planetarity. Now, this was a term that did make it into the English edition of the Dictionary of Untranslatables because um, the English edition editors asked her to contribute it. In her entry, Spivak criticized the reliance of Western environmentalist discourse on presuppositions of Western reason and universalism. She proposed planetarity as what she called a mode of alterity, positioning Aboriginal animism in dialectic relation to the quote, spectral white mythologies of post-rational science. The planet, she had already affirmed in Death of a Discipline, is in the species of alterity belonging to another system. And yet she said, we inhabit it on loan. <laughs> 
Spivak's planetarity, which treats language as an ecology, much like Guattari does, is based on loanship, not the kind of capitalist loan that exacts interest payments or a moral attitude of beholdenness to the lender. And of course, on this concept uh, in translation theory, we, we remember Derrida's what is a relevant translation. So um, a loanship not, not based on um, interest payments or a moral attitude of beholdenness to the lender, but the loanship of loan words transversally vectoring pre and post-colonial time zones and cultural configurations. Discussing in another context how the Bengali word hawk, H-O-K, became a loan word grafted from hawk or al-hawk, an Arabic expression connoting truth and social justice in the sense of genuine, real, right or righteous, and that often stands in for the name of Allah in the Quran. Spivak found herself arriving back at planetarity via a leap of translation. Hak, she asserted, carries a sense of the quote, para-individual structural responsibility into which we are born, that is our true being, with a proviso that responsibility be taken as an approximative translation for what she called a structural positioning that goes back to um, ancient notions of birthright. It is this approximate or approximative space, this not quite English sense of what she calls my hawk, that hatches the invention of a new theorem of global criticality, and that is planetarity, a term predicated on, quote, a pre-capitalist feeling of responsibility for the planet that eludes a, rationally, a rationally justifiable teleology. You will indulge me, she writes, if I say that the planet is here, as perhaps always, a catechesis for inscribing collective responsibility as right." End of quote. Spivak prompts ecosophical theory to run the experiment of thinking responsibility as right and the para-individual as a pre-capitalist political formation. Considered together, they produce changes in how rights are exerted and where they are distributed. Moreover, Spivak's rather wild dilation on my hawk potentially seeds new notions of plural rights, especially when full measure is taken of the magnetic pull in Arabic between Haq as truth, justice, and kanun, right, system of laws. It also opens up an interesting space for rethinking environmental rights. As Ali ben Makhlouf has indicated, and we can have the next slide, the authority and autonomy of nature in Anglophone legal doctrines of natural law and natural right are destabilized and environmentally enlarged when deterritorialized in an Arabic frame. Um, and you can see Ben um, McClough writes, natural right and natural law, as phrases found in Locke's works, refer respectively to the rights established by God and to a law prior to civic civil order. The adjective natural refers to something understandable. But speaking of the right of nature or the law of nature as Hobbes does suggests that nature as a substantive, meaning a set of natural facts, has some rights on its own or is embodied in a set of laws which is hard to understand as such, or at least seems very odd. In Arabic, we can talk about rights of environment rather than that of nature. I'm getting close to concluding here, a little bit more. As it takes off <clears throat> from the loan word hawk towards a theory of justice oriented to the rights of environment rather than of nature, Spivakian planetarity gains ecosophical traction as a translational ecology. This is an ecology that works political philology across European and non-European languages and philosophical traditions, moving through episodes of mistranslation retranslation and semantic lines of flight or conceptual leaps. It was in a similarly kinetic groove that Guattari located Ecosophie 
identifying it at the conjuncture of three ecologies, environmental, social, and mental, and describing to it four dimensions, flux, feedback, autopoiesis, and process. While Guattari's ecosophie is weighted towards micropolitics and Spivak's planetarity is weighted towards ethics, both, one could say, are concerned with planetary being as an urgent problem of Sophia, which is to say a problem of multiple knowledge forms, mobile sites of cognition and subjectivities without a subject, rippling across sites of environmental emergency and slow violence. It's along this acosophy planetarity axis that a climate change lexicon or dictionary of climate justice might be imagined. As a guide, we might look to the interactive digital platform. We can have the next slide, Feral Atlas, the more than human Anthropocene with feral an adjective signaling the devastating planetary impact of industrial infrastructures that have exceeded human control. Edited and curated by Anat Singh, Jennifer Deeger, Alder Kellerman Saxena, and Faith Shao, working with over 100 scientists, the Atlas models what is perhaps the most ambitious and far reaching experiment to date in lexalizing climate justice. Rolled out at the Istanbul Biennial of 2018, it is a genre bending dynamical research object, part glossary part cartographic navigator, part exercise in transmedial choreography, mobilizing poetry, film, art, architecture, maps, and scholarly bibliography. This medial relationality, miming the unforeseen mutations of complex systems in the process of accumulation and breakdown, is marshaled in the service of tracking and monitoring anthropogenic impacts on biodiversity aerosols and pollution plumes across the Pacific Ocean, toxic fog settled in industrial valleys that inst instigate spasms of asphyxia, what's called fog asthma, land subsidence precipitated by ghost water draining away in hydro management pumping systems. These are among the ecosystems entered like dystopic magical worlds through the portals of key words. What comes to the fore is a visual as well as verbal codicil of ecocide, in which technical terms for environmental destruction and violence to the biome gesture toward a glossary of what Natasha Myers calls molecular intuitions, where the micropolitics of matter play out. At this micro scale, one might propose an entry on air that's not in the feral atlas that begins with Luce Irigaray's critique of Heidegger's Forgetting of Air, book from 1983 that I think um, deserves to be re-examined today, and proceeds to Alain Damasio's poem, P pour puissance, P for power, where politics is literally pulled from the air in gusts of wind, bearing grains and germs um, that infuse every inhalation of breath. Damasio quotes the invisible committee, quote, the world does not surround us, it traverses us. What we inhabit inhabits us, not as form, but as force. Got the, I forgot to mute out the sirens. Another transversal axis would examine a, a cosmopolitics as a network of reciprocal codependent or interpassive processes drawing up perhaps on Emanuela Kucha's vegetal planisphere. We can never be material, materially separated from the matter of the world, he writes in the, the Life of Plants. For Kocha, plants modify the cosmic milieu just as they are modified by it. All beings that inhabit the earth are co-productive materials. The failure to recognize this sharing environment, he notes elsewhere, leads to the way nations treat climate as something politically pre-given to dispose of at will, rather than as the threshold at which politics is suspended. For both Latour and Kocha, politics must reorient to a planetary justice that re-legislates productive communality and, and recognizes the microorganism's right to exist, the soil's right to non-spoliation, 
While this cosmopolitics of earth and atmosphere are at a distinct remove from the radical ethos of Guattari's molecular revolution, it arguably bridges le moment philosophique of 68 and le moment écosophique of now by tapping into the imminent materialities of earthly affairs. Now, just for a very brief conclusion um, that kind of sums up some of the questions of around how to, how if we to remake, remake the dictionary into a kind of ecosophical dictionary of climate justice or a glossary of climate injustice, how would we do this? Uh, how would we move it towards, a, and I think one of the general points of my argument is that we need to move it into, and it's hard to do, but a theory of translational materialism that builds on the Guattarian um, models of eco-subjectivities eco as well as and, and, and with, in conjugation with Spivakian planetarity, the latter, as we've seen, founded on a non-neurocentric principle of cohabitus, shaped by the consciousness of inhabiting a planet on loan. In emphasizing plurilingual linguistic ecologies in the wider compass of critical resource studies, a through line becomes the alteration of preset ideas about what a language is, its limits as a medium, its edges of translatability, its relation to physical matter, its status as material of both nomos and cosmos. Yet another through line concerns a polemical desire to counter the monolectal tendencies of environmental, environmentalism and the epistemic blinkers they reinforce. And this is just a common sense observation that most NGOs that are doing valuable work on e ecology, eco-political eco um, intervention are speak English or speak Globish. Um, so how do we begin to adjust for a, the fact that English terms don't necessarily translate to the context um, in which interventions are happening? Finally, there's the through line that interrogates what it means to translate ecocide. Something I didn't develop here, but I do consider in this book that I'm trying, desperately trying to finish called What is Just Translation? And here I've looked to literary ecology, literary ecology, with examples that range from a new English translation of a 19th century um, uh, translator, thinker, uh, David Amalo, uh, he, he, there's been this recent translation of a Hawaiian cosmology. Another example, Natalie Diaz's Poetics of Reparation called Post-Colonial Love Poems directed at settler colonial language appropriation and the corporate dispossession of the rain. And John Kinsella, an Australian anarchist, eco-anarchist, John Kinsella's hyper-translation of, of Rimbaud's A Season in Hell, where hell is transposed to an ecocidal dystopian vision of the anthropocenic endgame. In each of these cases, and of course you can think of many more, ecopoesis functions not as a descriptive catch-all for nature-themed writing and pastoral genres, nor is it an instrumental raw material molded to fit a particular ecopolitical agenda. It is instead construed as an act of translation or as a set of processes of translation that releases that release into circulation ecosophical vocabularies of indigenous cosmos and ecologies of mind and matter, in which mind does not treat matter as a passive, practico inert, but as its coextensive material in common. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, <clears throat> Emily, uh, for this. Um, um, amazingly rich um, uh, proposal. Um, my suggestion would right now be that um, you, all of you can either put uh, questions in the chats and I will read them, but, we're, um, but you can also simply come on camera and phrase your question yourself. Um, you can just raise your uh, electronic hands and then we can directly move into the discussion. Um, 
I give you a moment to think um, and um, maybe raise a first uh, a question just to get us get us going and then afterwards um, um, we can move to a sheet. I was wondering um, about um, one move that you made, uh, namely when you uh, moved from um, the eco-philosophical Guattarian position and brought it together with Latour's um, account of a planetary ethics. Um, the, and, and I understand this conceptual move also because it provides you with, I think, a, a systematic framing of the planetarity concept in, in Spivak. And, and, and I see that the planet becomes uh, then um, an, a, a crucial, let's say, um, 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 a reference point per se for an ethical um, um, reflection. I was wondering if in that transition from Gattari to Latour, something, something is also lost um, strangely. Namely, um, you may know that Frédéric Lordon has quite uh, rigidly um, criticized uh, Bruno Latour for on hundreds of pages, never one speaking about capitalism, um, which seems to be absolutely crucial for a Guattarian position, given the fact that, right, I mean, um, um, The anti oedipus is a book on capitalism and the type of subjectivity it produces and it limits and so forth. So, so, so would you say that one needs because, I mean, capitalism deals with the problem that you're describing in a very specific way, right? I mean, um, of course, um, um, all these regions sort of look different, but totally not, right? I mean, that is capitalism somehow. That, that is, there is a process of indifferentiation that is monocultural in the, insofar as it preserves all cultural identities within a more abstract general framework of, of the value form and all that. So how, how does that play a role for, for you? Um, I'm, I'm, this Gatterian, uh, Deleuzean, and also in Negri, um, um, this aspect that seems to be really crucial for, for these reflections. My first answer to that would be that um, for, I have to track down Lordon's critique of Latour. Uh, I've read, you know, earlier Lordon followed him, but it would be, I think, relevant for me to take stock of that particular critique. Um, I, I, and from what I know of Lordon's work and from what you're saying, I would completely agree that one of the weaknesses of Latour uh, I mean, he tries to kind of get to politics in his own peculiar way. And he's got some rather interesting ways of thinking politics in the, in, the inquiry into modes of existence, um, which of course is more of a collective work, in fact, than, than his writing. And in this down to earth book, uh, but it's, 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 it's a kind of cosmopolitical ethics without a critique of capitalism. And, you know, the easy answer would be to say, um, <laughs> he's a conservative Catholic thinker in some ways. And um, probably, you know, and it's no accident that he leaves out not just the, the kind of critique of capitalism within Guattarian ecosophie, but he, he leaves out Guattari altogether from what I've been able to see. I mean, it's a, it's a strange, uh, French thinkers do this. They sort of announce a new theory and then strategically either don't cite or are blithely unaware of the fact that something hugely relevant like ecosophie, which should in some ways be the departing framework for what he's after is, is simply elided. It's simply elided. It's a, it's a kind of, and maybe it's a, as a translator coming to it from without the French context, um, it, it screams it in my face. Whereas even some of the more recent French ecoso, ecosofo political thinkers like Pierre Charbonnier, who's written this book called um, Abondance et liberté. It's a kind of political theoretical critique of, of abundance and resources and 
no mention of this of this earlier history, which to me screams out for for rereading and for for rethinking. Um, so, I mean, it, it, it's 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 really these strategic effacements of important kinds of thinking um, probably have, you know, as I say, easy explanations, anti-Marxism, pure and simple, not hard. Um, but I think it's more interesting than that, especially since, you know, there are certain kinds of Guattarianism that have remained robust, especially in the, in the, with with Deleuze and the critique of of the, the sort of the information society the the digital commons all of that 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 somehow I think still you know the, the the kind of flux problematic it's only more present with us the dehierarchization of discursivity of uh, that's are, that are embedded in language and languages of power that Foucault and Guattari are involved in, that has, I think, only be, gained more momentum and traction. Um, but the, oddly, the, the different strands, I mean, the, the, the greatest proponents, at least in the French context of a, of a prolonged critique of anti-capitalism is Luc Boltanski and some of his co-authors, but they don't take on ecology at all. They're, they, they have interesting things to say about, you know, complotisme, about cons the structures of conspiracy, viral denialisms, you know, there, there's a lot going on there. I, and Or the recently reissued book on the problem of justification, which I think has ramifications for how we negotiate the, the legal and jurisprudential aspect of eco-politics, but they're just missing connections. It's as if, and, and it's it's also a kind of, I mean, Guattari himself had problems with the Green, with the green Party already. If uh, you could get lost in the weeds of what his specific, specific issues were with um, different Green Party leaders and at what moment, but there is this think a general suspicion of the greens in Europe that is also led to a kind of flattening of the Im implications for a more ecosophical way of thinking. Uh, or they just simply don't know those writings of, of Guattari, which were more marginal than his other texts. Yeah, um, th no, th th thank you. I because there is a danger that certain forgettings and certain oblivions, systematic forgettings, come with a political bias, right? I mean, or yes. leads to a certain political positioning, um, even against one's better will and intention, maybe um, um, on some level. Um, sorry, no. Um, thank you for for that. Dominic Smith might um, has comes next, please. Maybe I'll mute myself. Dominic, I don't hear you. Can you yeah. try again? Yeah, you. Sound underwater. Maybe you need to take the thing. Apologies. Can you? Yeah. Yes. Much better. Thank you. Um, so I, I just wondered if I'd skip the queue. Was there Sheen in? to ask a question. Um, I'm happy to go if you'd like me to, Frank. No, no, Oshin basically has to pick up his daughter, so he's on his phone, And but if he's back in time, he will raise it then. Great, thank you. Um, and thanks ever so much. I actually, I had uh, two, two questions, um, and uh, one was to do with, um, I, I was struck uh, when you were talking um, about the, um, well, I was struck by the, the, the COP26 uh, event, which we recently had in Scotland. Um, and, it, and it got me thinking about the status of acronyms um, mm. as, as speech acts um, within uh, Globish, uh, let's say, or, or as speech acts that um, assert a certain Anglophone dominance. Um, because I'm, I'm uh, very struck when I, I speak with colleagues, particularly in the French context, how um, they're often either offended 
by um, acronyms or how they find them uh, laughable. Um, the, the, the kind of at least British um, fetishization of the acronym they find very interesting. Um, and it strikes me that the acronyms are often very repressive. Um, you know, COP, and um, perhaps it's just those uh, sirens I was hearing in the background. Um, or, um, you know, at the University of Dundee, we have uh, acronyms such as Castle or Army. Um, and, and I wonder if there's something in that. So that's just one slightly speculative point. And the other more concrete point was to do with um, uh, art and translation. And I wondered um, what you think about uh, art. So artworks, uh, installations in particular as, as sites um, and how they, uh, how we think about translation um, uh, in, in respect of them. Um, naively, I, I want to think about artworks as, as sites of perhaps communicative action on a Habermasian level, but I, I, I say that that might be very naive, and I wonder if you've got a reflection on it. Um, and to tie those two points together, there is um, an artwork uh, which I was thinking of, um, which I can put in the chat. It's by uh, an artist, um, Wayne Beniti, who uh, is, is based in Glasgow, and he did some work um, around COP26 uh, where he captured um, Antarctic air um, from 1765 and invited people to interact um, with, with the air and to hear it uh, bubbling in, um, in a site in Glasgow. Um, I'll put a link to that in the chat, but I'll stop there um, with the profusion of questions. Thank you. Um, yeah, great questions. So I, I don't have sort of immediate answers because they seem in some ways like observations that lead out to more speculation. Um, on um, the French offendedness by, <laughs> by acronyms. Um, the term for acronym is sometimes, if I'm not mistaken, sigle, uh, which is to do with, which, which lines up, I think, and it's the same in English, uh, with brands, branding and logos and uh, rebuses, and they, it's, you could say, and you know, I've thought a little bit, I've, I've published an essay on memes as a form of alpha, alphabetic literacy in the Trump era, um, political literacy that, trans, that goes beyond certain generations and forms of public media. And even emojis can fall into this. They, and they become in Asia quite a different use from in the Anglophone world. So you're, you're then into script systems and modes of exchange, modes of exchange of product uh, that I think um, get us back to the question of capitalism and the, the, the ways in which capitalism communicates. And then of course, let's just think about how you know, internet speak in the purely corporate framework or corporate lingo, where sometimes depending on the, on the kind of microculture you're living in, it's incomprehensible. It's a complete jargon unto itself that challenges Guattarian jargon, you know, a minute. Um, and you have to, and it's a sign of, in a sense, um, these kinds of, specializations that are in-group oriented. You could do a little sociology of them like uh, gender and, and video games, um, the, you know, there are certain kinds of trading, trading lingo on the trading floor, which is often also very masculinist and sexist and racist. <laughs> um, and so I think, I mean, and then, of course, there's just the way in which the French have this very old fashioned um, protectionism about anything that is anglophonic that's seeping into their language and contaminating it. And there are all kinds of different motives for that. Some of them good left motives, some of them really bad right wing motives. But a lot of this right now, of course, and for years now, is being carried on and in the French Academy where Cassin herself was recently elected a member. And she's, she's, I think on both sides of this issue, you know, on the one hand, trying to 
ward off globish on the other um and i think in some ways not interestingly i think it, it warrants a more critical because it also can become very exclusive that kind of gatekeeping of language um, i think what you were referring to in the british context is something that's sort of offensive and neo-colonial and ridden with kind of corporate complicity but there are other kinds of idiolects of that are sort of underground languages specialized knowledges that um that break that don't fall easily into that um characters characterization but it leads into the second one which is that i think there's um and something i'm grappling with and it's it's a really hard question of the link the link between um you know how we think of a language or a unit of of translatability especially in an era of digital pan translatability of different orders of script and representation and the blurring of boundaries in through alpha numeracy right where um you know it used to be there was a a, a very firm distinction between transcoding and translation transcoding simply um not being interpretive but just a kind of something more modeled on what a computer does uh, well that's not so clear anymore especially when you look even at the legacy of um the mixing of algebraic or alphanumeric formulations in logical positivism uh the reuse of that in computer programming and the questions that throws open for what is a language you know what are the bounds of its semiosis what is the what are its visual limits its transmedial limits um of course, sound studies is also entered into this as well as art. So, you know, I've I've looked a, done a talk re, not so long ago on the work of a, an artist named Mel Bachner who problematizes, you know, the kind of affective um, limits of a language, especially since he uses diacritic affect markings as forms of a language of communication, but he's also interested in his earlier work on line as language and what is a drawing or design or a dink build, you know, a, a kind of uh, a, a thought diagram that mathematicians often use as a language to communicate to each other. And so all of these issues, I think, are part of what I'm trying to get at with the title, What is Just Translation, which sounds a bit cute, but it actually does describe um, questions of racial, political, and economic injustice in the first part. And in the second part, it leads more into these questions about um, what are what is just a tra translation? What are the limits of its mediality? That's great. Uh, thanks so much. Yeah, apologies for the sound issues. Um, thank you. Um, again, a reminder, you can put any question in the chat and I will read it out or you come on as uh, we just did. I'm, I, I'll just um, uh, step in with another one, if you allow, um, um, because I was um, wondering, you ended, almost ended, with the eco-poetological or poetic mm -hmm. um, dimension. And if I understand correctly, the, um, I mean, and you move there by saying that this is a move against what you described as monolexical tendency, um, right? I mean, so the, which, which also must have something to do with the distinction that you that you complicate beforehand between justice and rights, uh, right? Um, um, because the language of rights, I mean, that would, again, sorry for playing that card, um, that would be from a Marxist perspective, of course, um, already problematic per se, because um, right, that language itself is formed, um, well, is, is the way in which bourgeois societies talk about themselves, uh, essentially, right? Um, but, but if I understood correctly, the move that you made beforehand is that sometimes it's not clear what is simply the language of right in that bourgeois way and, and what is actually and what actually contains the claim to justice that sort of exceeds or undermines the distinction between, between the two or the, 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 the strict um, separation of the two. Now, I was wondering if that is would be a case for echo for an echo poetic intervention to point out these let's say zones of indistinction or ambiguities or in in singular singular cases um 
what is the standard for their appropriateness? That was, uh, um, so is it sometimes, for example, appropriate to also miss it in the right way, just to, to translate wrongly in the right way, to make it legible or to, um, to fail um, uh, in the right way? Because sometimes it's necessary to vulgarize Necessary, for example, for political reasons, right, or for 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 reasons of generating a certain legibility or visibility that otherwise doesn't exist, or or is the standard itself? I mean, the standard must. Where, where does the standard come from? Is it strategic? Is it? Um, I mean, okay, I know that that is basically asking what you mean when you say just, um, but but some, somehow um, could 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 you say something about that? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I would have recourse to Cassin's idea of consistent relativism. Um, that, on the one hand, the whole point of philosophizing in languages is to get, in a sense, rid of the the possibility of these kinds of a priori's of of certain terms of uh, transcendental terms of transcendental notions of truth um, that you know philosophy really grounds itself in or um, in a sense in the individualized property notion of subjectivity that um, is very much part of a liberal rights structure um, at least within a an anglophone context that then gets kind of fused with certain um, you know, liberal traditions within German and French thought to create this thing called a rights structure. Um, but there are terms in, for earth rights that would seem to be a priority, you know, if uh, cosmological premises don't worry so much about whether there's some sort of in universalist invocation, uh, that is part of the a kind of sense of community. I mean, when Natalie Diaz invokes a, a sense of a right to reappropriate the water from the sky, even though access and use to that rainwater has been hived off by a, a corporation, uh, even though it falls in tribal lands. Um, it becomes a battle over a poesis. It's a process of poesis. The conflict takes place at, a, at the staging ground of poesis that is materially grounded. And so it doesn't, it doesn't divide neatly between say, bad universalism and, and good particularisms in philosophy through philosophizing in languages, uh, which takes away from this kind of Euro dominant structure of histories of philosophy that treat concepts, architecture as some kind of unchanging or freestanding monolith that then is appropriated into capitalist structures of domination, you know, in that, um, and become their spoken or unspoken premise of entitlement. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's hard to say, to respond to this question with, a, with a, a one or the other. I think it's very context specific and that, the, that you come up against the limits of languages uh, to even articulate certain problems of say rights, environmental right. And that's why I was, I was letting myself work with terms that, you know, with, with some help from people who know Arabic, obviously. Um, but I think that can be done as a, as a serious model of, of, for doing philosophy that doesn't necessarily take on capitalism point for point. It simply gets to places that not even a, a good respectable capitalist critique will take you to. But when you say capitalism is monolectal, Yes, um, but the, the, even there, there's a problem in terms of what language it speaks in and what kind of authority it arrogates to itself. You know, there's a lot of 
naive Marxist application that doesn't apply and that is also blinkered or unhearing to local context because it's so sure of where it wants to go or what wants to say. At the same time, there are indigenous movements that embrace Marxism, but would you say there's a right reading or a wrong reading? No, it's, it's context specific. It makes sense because it makes sense on that land or it doesn't. And, and to the question of um, translating rightly and wrongly, I love that one. I mean, there is, I think, um, a lot, there's a certain play between the rights of trend to, to translation and also the, but the problem of translation is a form of violation um, that, you know, appropriates language. It's translation is one of the few cases of what I call authorized plagiarism in language. Um, and when it does that, I mean, the, the one example I look at is the Faulkner's appropriation of a native term for the a river, which uh, Yachna Batafa, which is the county that he named his whole saga after the Yachna Batafa County novels of Faulknerian Gothic. Um, and he comes up in an interview with this ar argument that he's kind of paying homage to dispossessed peoples, which all sounds good, except that then he makes the analogy to the Confederate South destituted after the Civil War. And you think, whoops, uh-oh. Uh, <laughs> it's like massive appropriation, right? And so these are kind of concrete examples of translation as violation or appropriation violently appropriative. Uh, and it's it's hard to generalize. You know, you have to kind of go case by case, but the this is the when you get into the some of the issues that translation brings to bear on um, the uses of especially um, other vocabularies other than say the, the discourses of philosophy that one's used to that's that that's i think the frontier we're in you know i think that it's we've got to try and do that work very carefully because you can re replicate appropriationism in a minute but thank you um next is uh, my colleague tina Rao. Slight Hi. technical difficulties, sorry. Hi, thank you very much for this talk. It was very exciting to me. I work in sort of a parallel universe. I work on process ontology and dynamic thinking of physics, free and becoming, but in a very much more materialist sense. Mm -hmm. So it's less about thinking within the context of language. And so um, just the last couple of comments that you made. I'm sorry for the background. I'm, I'm not very good with technology. <laughs> um, <laughs> When you talk about language kind of leading into capitalism or this relation with between Western language and capitalism, it almost kind of sounds of there is like a reverse a sapir wolf theory going on. It's as if the structure of language pushes thinking into a certain direction. That would be like a very Heideggerian argument, I think. And um, I just wanted to ask um, if you could expand on that more, if there really is such a thing as there is a structures embedded within language that push thinking into a certain direction and if that's the case what can we do about that and the second thing i wanted to say um, about what you just discussed was about this question of just and unjust translations maybe it's a case of just using different um, criteria and um, what about creative translations translations that are empowering or generative or that have some creative potential Whereas appropriation is just commodifying. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't create anything. So it's less about right or wrong. And even if it is, in a way, as Frank said, a, a wrong translation, if you look at the concept of correctness, if it, so many readings of philosophers that are wrong are hugely creative and bring whole traditions of new ways of thinking. And I was wondering whether we shouldn't just use stop assessing things on, 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 on this very linear, just, unjust, right, wrong, black, white, yes, no, and see what can we do with it? Is it creative? Does it generate something? And, and yeah, what, I was just wondering what you thought about these ideas. Thank you. Yeah, well, um, I'm totally on your page with, you know, and 
I, I did a, a whole chapter of a book on interference. Translation is interference that looked at, um, you know, it started with a, a, a term that I can't pronounce in Greek that, that Derrida um, tries to translate in, in uh, Plato, Plato's laws, and it ends up being a fabulous kind of complication of the, of meddling of, and it's basically, you know, a loose translation would be fuck with your head. <laughs> it's, that's, that would be the strong translation of what Plato is, is after. <laughs> it's like, uh, and it's, so I think the, and, and the other example I had a lot of fun with was Beckett's uh, translation of, of Rambeau's A Drunken Boat, where it was considered a perverse translation because, you know, wildly unfaithful. Um, and I, I, I sort of thought of that as tran creative, tran translating untranslatably, uh, that really pushes something. So I, I'm, by looking at translation in its capacity as a form of violation and appropriation, I don't mean to suggest that there's a normative or right way of translating. No, not at all. In fact, I think one of the, the things that bubbles up out of the Kotarian and that uh, in the longer version of this that I've developed would go in the direction of creative eco-poesis, uh, looking, say, at Kinsella's work or at a bunch of other people who have, have experimented with hyper-translation. Um, you know, wildly unfaithful. I mean, what, what Kinsella basically does is he, 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 he finds, and it's actually faithful. It's actually faithful to the original. It's just, he, he finds that where Ram, Rambeau is talking about deforestation and um, an incredible kind of capitalist ransacking of, 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 um, laborers' communities and um, the ap ap apocalypse of toxic plumes, you know, all these things. So there's, there's that kind of hyper-translation that would fit, I think, extremely well into your idea of a creative praxis, a creative translation that is a form of critical intervention. And I think that's exactly what if you wanted to assign a translation theory to Guattari, that's one of the things I'm pulling out of this, very, very much so. Um, and it's different from, say, a kind of eco-political criticism and literary criticism that you find, which is highly theme-oriented. It's very theme-driven, and it doesn't necessarily look at language as a creative ecology in itself. It it's, treats language as something quite passive as a kind of passive material. Um, and that, so I would pull what I'm doing out away from that very distinctly. Um, there is this book by Jennifer Wenzel that is more interesting that looks at kind of how at Bhopal in various novels and, um, you know, sort of petrochemical fallout from the, as it becomes a form of narrative practice. So there would be a kind of parallel there. And finally, there was one more comment I would make about this really interesting point. I mean, um, I do want to think of language as matter, as materiality, and not as something that is somehow belongs only to um, something cognitive or structure. Oh, yes, it relates to your question about structures. Um, I mean, Yes, uh, clearly when you have the experience of translating or going between languages, you are in the wharf appear moment of, oh, wow, when you say that there are like 50 names for snow in Hopi, uh, snow kind of comes out really differently. Um, but then there's, there's also other factors that are part of the, inter the atmosphere of language, which is say sound or intonation and the, you know, the entire kind of affective um, echo chamber that, or ambient, ambient context that 
in flex language and that I don't think a cognitive structure or purely structuralist account of language takes on board, even if it, you know, someone like Ben Veniste, who is a brilliant linguist and very aware of multilingual conditions, modes of address, intersubjectivity effects within modes of address. I don't think he takes on, you know, in a sense, the kinds of sounds or the way in which, and, and there's a lot of attention right now to translating, you know, microaggressions within language, the, the harming, the effects of harming in languages that are not just insults or injury, but that are to do with environments and that, doesn't fit into a wharf superior framework very well. I think it needs to be, or if it does, it needs it needs to be modified. The echo chambers. Yeah, just on that last point, and there's a very interesting book called um, Martin Heidegger's Save My Life, which engages precisely with this moment of microaggression. Um, and it is a very long reflection on just what it means to how to react to microaggressions within language. And the author makes a point that reading Heidegger doing philosophy helped him be able to play with the language in a way as to not rebut, but take the sting out of the microaggression and turn it back onto the perpetrator, so to speak. Hmm. And it's a, very, it's a very short read, but it's very interesting. Hmm. Who wrote it? Do you remember? Uh, Not right now, but I can look it up. <laughs> yeah. I'll put it in the chat. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's great. I think with this, we breached. If there are other questions, please come forward. Otherwise, um, because it doesn't seem uh, to be the case, um, it is uh, my task and a pleasure to once again thank Emily for sharing this with us and discussing with us so energetically. Um, thank, it's always uh, most exciting. Um, oh yeah, okay, that's the that's the link. Tina just put it in the chat um, to discuss work which is still um, being written and being thought. And one one notices that. Um, thank you very much, Emily. Uh, thank it was you, a true pleasure. Great. And uh, say goodbye to Oshin for me. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.